What a joy it is to be with you this evening. I'd like to begin our time in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, Lord, Creator, Lawgiver and Judge, Master and Provider, Architect and Healer, You are all these things and much more because You are from all eternity Abba Father. The eternal Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came to us to take what is ours to give us what is His. Nothing less than a share in that divine sonship which You have eternally bequeathed to Him. And in His name we pray for the spirit of sonship to fall upon us now once again to illuminate our minds with the light of truth, the light of the world, and to enkindle our hearts with the fire and passion of Your fatherly love. So help us and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The title of my presentation is rather provocative. (laughs) Abba or Allah, the difference it makes. I want to step back and indicate to you that for the last quarter of a century or so, I have shared a conviction with a number of people, a growing number of scholars, that Islam really does represent the single greatest force of the third millennium and also the single greatest challenge and threat to Christianity worldwide. Instead of just allowing that to create in us a defensive and reactionary attitude, I think our response ought to be more thoughtful and more prayerful. But I think it should have been that a quarter of a century ago when I first entered the Catholic Church. 25 years ago at the Easter Vigil in 86. I remember within the next two years teaching courses and affirming this thought that world communism was almost a distraction compared to the much larger threat that was looming, and that was resurgent Islam. Back then, the quizzical and incredulous expressions that comment received were consistent. They were like, you've got to be kidding. When the Iron Curtain came down in 89 and the Soviet Union disintegrated by 91 and 92, this was becoming more apparent, I think, to a growing number of people. This was all about 10 years before 9-11. Around that time, I got a call from a dear friend, a family member, asking me if I would consider a public debate with a Muslim scholar. I said, let me think about it a while. No. (laughs) And he said, would you reconsider? I said, what would the topic be? He said, the Trinity. And I said, oh, emphatically not. (laughs) How would you even begin to debate such a thing? And then he did something really mischievous. He got my sister on the phone, because this happened to be my brother-in-law. And Barb began gently pleading with me. And I guess I was a softy back then, so I conceded. Okay, fine. It was a year off, and besides, you know, things that are over a year away feel as though they're never really going to come anyway. And so reluctantly I agreed. Six or seven months later, I had forgotten about it. I wasn't really preparing for it. I mean, I had been studying Islam on my own in a kind of amateurish, self-taught way. But at that point in the year, we were traveling out to sea my sister and her family. And I was surprised when I got there by my brother-in-law's announcement that guess who else happens to be passing through town this week? He said, oh, and he gave me this name, Muhammad Abdullah, 
and I can't remember the full name. And I'm like, okay, do I know him? He said, no, but you will because he's the scholar you'll be debating in just a few months on the subject of the Trinity. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I had forgotten about that. He said, well, I hope you don't mind, but I set up breakfast tomorrow morning. So we got up early. We drove down. We were the only car in the parking lot. We said a prayer. We both walked in, and the place was empty. And I said, well, he must have forgotten. Let's leave, you know. We sat down instead and ordered some coffee. And a few moments later, in walked a a gentleman. And he was, you know, wearing his headgear. I stood up, and I shook his hand, and we exchanged greetings and sat down. And to make a long story short, we jumped right into the debate topic. He wanted to talk shop theology. So within the first two or three minutes, we were talking about God and this conception of Allah and the abstraction of the Trinity. And I learned very quickly that this scholar had gone around the country and on many occasions and many different campuses had debated Christian scholars on this topic and others. About four or five minutes into the conversation, I referred to God as Father, and he pounded his fist on the table, stopped me mid-sentence, and he said, do not blaspheme. And I wasn't aware of blaspheming. I don't like blaspheming with breakfast any more than the next guy. And I said, how did I blaspheme? He said, you called God Father. Fatherhood is human. It's not divine. It's finite. It's not infinite. It's blasphemy to take what belongs to creatures and ascribe it to Allah. Well, I didn't want to see him get upset anymore, and so I changed the subject, and soon we were talking about Jesus. And about four minutes later, I mentioned Jesus and how we see him as the Son of God. And I didn't quite finish that sentence either, and his fist came down even louder on the table. But this time, there were a few customers in the restaurant looking at me like, you've got a problem. (laughs) But it wasn't swearing. You know, he he looked at me, he said, I've asked you once, twice, but not again. Do not blaspheme. And I asked him what I said, and he said, you referred to Jesus as Son of God, and that too is human, it's not divine. It's temporal, it's not eternal. And so that is the essence of blasphemy. Well, I was wondering to myself at that moment, how are we going to proceed to debate the Trinity in public if I can't refer to the Father or the Son? But I wasn't about to ask him that. Instead, I wanted to find some common ground to kind of build upon. And so I appealed to the principle of analogy. I said to him, you know, when we think in terms of God, we use analogy. And so we ascribe to God power. And we say that God is unlimited in power. He's omnipotent. And that's infinite, whereas we also have power, but it's finite. And he agreed, Allah is omnipotent. So I took the next step. I said, we also ascribe knowledge to God. And we speak of his omniscience. And of course, we base that on our own experience of coming to know, understanding, knowledge, even though ours is finite. And he agreed. Allah is omniscient. So I took it one more step. And I said, we also speak of God's goodness, his omnibenevolence. And in fact, his mercy, knowing that Allah, the all-merciful one, was one of the 99 titles. And so I said, you know, we take power, we take knowledge, we take goodness and mercy, and we could add love and say that, that God is good, God is merciful, God is loving in a perfect way, and we are too, but it's flawed, it's imperfect. And I said, thinking in terms of analogy, we could bundle all of these attributes together power, knowledge, goodness, mercy, love, attribute them to God and then just kind of label it as Father and see that fatherhood is perfect in Him, but it's imperfect in us. And he shook his head. And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, because Allah doesn't love as a father. And he could tell I wasn't tracking him that well, so he said, let me explain. And he went on to tell me how he had just finished a doctoral program, and I congratulated him. I was still working on mine. He said, oh, that's not it. I'm going off for a postdoc up in New York. And I said, that's also wonderful. And he said, my point is, I've lived in Philadelphia, and I've had an apartment, and I've had a pet because in my lease, pets were allowed, a dog. And he said, but when I'm moving here in a few weeks, 
I've signed a lease at an apartment where they don't allow pets. And so I'm looking at this dog, which I love, and it looks as though I may have to kill it. And I thought he was kidding. And so I kind of smiled, you know, and I'm like, with love like that, you know, who needs hate? (laughs) He wasn't amused. He was staring back right into my eyes. But he went on to explain how Allah is an owner. And we are property. He is a master. And we are slaves. And I realized that as uncomfortable as that might make me feel, he was really doing a very adequate job of expressing his faith with precision and clarity. And so I swallowed hard and we moved on for about four or five more minutes. And then I said something. And to this day, I don't even remember what it was. Bill and I tried to reconstruct it and I don't remember and he didn't either. But the third time proved to be a real deal breaker. He slammed his fist even harder and louder. He stood up now and he said, I've asked you once, twice, but not again. And that's all he said and he stormed out of the restaurant. And it was dead silence. Till the waitress came over, you know, are you ready to order? Well, <laughs> we were hungry at that point. We paid for our coffee in silence and walked out and sat in his car for about five minutes without saying a word until he looked at me. And Bill said, you know, I don't think I've ever really appreciated what it means to be able to say, our Father who art in heaven. And I said, Bill, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And my brother-in-law said, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And with that, he started up his car. (laughs) And we drove home, and we kind of forgot about it. Within a week, the scholar had contacted him to cancel our debate because he was offended by the sort of popular language that I used instead of the philosophical and abstract terms that he thought reputable scholars would employ. I was not upset. I was so relieved. But I must admit, I was also illuminated. I felt challenged to go back and not only rediscover certain mysteries of my own faith, but also to look at them in light of Islam. And so I did. Because when you do that, it sheds a lot of light. It also raises many questions, but it beckons you not only to further study, but to a deeper appreciation for what our Lord Jesus did back in the first century when he regularly addressed the deity in a way that not even the most devout rabbi would ever dare to do by speaking in terms of Abba, Father, like Papa, like Daddy. And something that we take for granted, it's almost like wallpaper, it's like white noise, it's like the old marble staircases that have been worn out through centuries of ascent and descent. We have called upon God as Father, not too much, but we have pondered that mystery too little. And I'm convinced that God is going to use Islam for many purposes, one of which is to provoke Christians to a deeper study and a deeper encounter, and most importantly, to a deeper experience of God's embrace as Father, of an intimate relationship between an all-perfect Father and imperfect sons and daughters. Before I look at that, though, I'd like to just consider a little bit more about Islam. Because I went on to study its historical origins and how the life of Muhammad is really the line of demarcation. He lived from 570 to 632, only 52 years, but really it was only the last 12 years of his life that mattered the most because he had that first revelation when he was 40. And then within a year or two, he began preaching this radical monotheism. And then in 622, what is the start of the Islamic calendar, that fateful trip to Medina, when he united the tribes of Arabia and had 10,000 soldiers and went back to his own birthplace, Mecca, and conquered it. By the time he died in 632, the entire Arabian Peninsula had been converted to a religion that wasn't even 15 years old. And it was mostly by force. 
But I dare say that those soldiers would have all passed lie detector tests when it came to their sincerity. And so we look at this historic occasion and recognize what a dividing line. But I also went on to consider something more about the history of Islam by considering its distant past. Because all of this took place in the Arabian Peninsula. All of this took place in the context of Arabic culture and the Arabic language. And so it's useful, I think, to go back in time long before Muhammad to understand a little bit more about Arabs and the Arabic heritage, because you probably know where we trace its origins all the way back to, and that is Abraham, the book of Genesis, and the fact that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman named Hagar, the Egyptian, who was not really Abram's wife, but his concubine, but the other wife, the real wife, was Sarah, who was barren. And so we read in Genesis 15 that God has made a promise to Abram. Your descendants shall be as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And Abraham believed. But notice in Genesis 15, 5 and 6, God said your seed would be as the stars of the sky, the sand, not you and Sarah. So in Genesis 16, after Abram's expressed his trust in God to fulfill his promise, What does Sarah, his true wife, who is barren in her old age, suggest to him an ancient, well-honored custom? Here, take my maidservant, Hagar, have relations with her, and if she conceives, we'll regard that son as mine. And sure enough, he did, and she did, and Ishmael was born. Ishmael the founding father of the Ishmaelites, the sons of Ishmael, Ben Ishmael. These are, of course, the Arabs. It's not something that anybody contests. That's why Muslims, especially those from Arabia, will speak of how they worship the God of Abraham and carry on the true faith of Abraham in the line of Abraham and Ishmael. And so by the end of Genesis 16, Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. And then there's an oracle about how he'll be a wild ass of a man, his hand against his kinsman, and everybody else for that matter. And we read that Abram was 86 years old when this son was born to his concubine. The first verse of the next chapter, Genesis 17, verse 1, we read Abram was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, I am God Almighty, walk before me blameless. So how many years between the birth of Ishmael and the new revelation of God? Thirteen years. Why does that matter? Because what is the new revelation of God in Genesis 17? A new covenant. A new covenant with the sign of this covenant being what? Circumcision. And in Genesis 17, what is the divinely stipulated rule for the age of circumcision? From now on, the son of Abraham must be circumcised on the 13th year? That's when the Egyptians did it. And after all, who was Hagar? Hagar the Egyptian. No, the Lord God said, The true son must be circumcised on the eighth day. At which point Abram is probably thinking, aren't you arriving a little late? He even declares to God, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. In other words, you know, give me a break. Give yourself a break. I mean, we're not going to have any more children. Oh, but you will. And this time it will be with Sarai who will get a new name, Sarah, just like you're going to get a new name from Abram to Abraham. I mean, it's almost like divine humor. What does Abram mean in Hebrew? Exalted father. And at 99, it doesn't fit. So we're going to change his name to Abraham, which in Hebrew means father of a multitude, which fits even less. Unless you have Abraham's faith. 
And so the Lord declares, one year from now, Sarah will give birth. And he laughed and she laughed. And so God said, call him laughter. Hitzak, Isaac. This was a real test of faith. I mean, gentlemen, I don't need to get into the details here and blur the lines of discretion. But at 99, if she's going to deliver 12 months from now, that leaves you about three months to recover from surgery. Because who else gets circumcised besides the next son on the eighth day? Abram does, now called Abraham. And in Genesis 17, who else gets circumcised? All of the males in Abram's household, including Ishmael at 13. To this day, when do you suppose Arab Muslims circumcise? Because they do. You can read about it in Jeremiah 9. On the eighth day, not exactly. On the 13th year, it's a rite of passage, a proof of maturity. Are you a boy or a man? Man, prove it. Hold still. And so in Genesis 17, this new covenant declares circumcision on the eighth day to be the true sign of the true heir. And it's not Ishmael through the slave woman, the concubine. It will be Isaac, joy, laughter through the true wife, Sarah. And sure enough, one year later, it all came true. Fast forward to Genesis 21, and we read about how Sarah nursed Isaac for three years, as was the custom back then. And at the weaning, there was a kind of party, because this marked the time when the mother would hand the child, the boy child, over to the father. And he would begin raising him as a father would raise a son. And as they're celebrating all of this in Genesis 21, in the midst of the festivities, Sarah walks in and sees Ishmael hit socking Isaac. It's a word play. What's he doing? Well, he could be just laughing with his little half brother, but that's not what Sarah took it to mean. He's taunting him. Taunting him in the Midrashim and in the Jewish interpretive tradition, Ishmael is basically saying, You think you're going to inherit from our father? He's a little too old for that, and I'm a little too big for you. And so when Sarah sees this exchange, she demands that Abraham do what? Excommunicate, banish Hagar and the slave son. And what does the Lord God do? He confirms Sarah's urging. And so Hagar, the concubine, the slave woman, and Ishmael, the slave son, are disinherited and banished. I mean, it doesn't exactly seem fair at one level, but it was necessary to keep this fraternal rivalry from just splitting the family of faith. But it also serves a profound purpose because these two sons of Abraham had two entirely different experiences of their common father. One man, Ishmael, related to his father through his mother. And what was his mother? A concubine, a slave. What was he? A slave. A child of Abraham, but really more of a slave. Whereas Isaac related to him much more in terms of a father through Sarah, his beloved wife. Now, I can't go into any more detail, but I want to share one more little tidbit because there was one more episode after that banishment in Genesis 21 when Ishmael's disinherited. Because at the end of Genesis 21, you come to the first verse of Genesis 22, and what does the Lord God say? After this, God tested Abram by saying, take your son and do what with him? Offer him as a holocaust to the place that I will show you. Now, if that's all the Lord God had instructed Abraham to do, take your son and offer him as a holocaust, I think I can predict what Abraham would have done next. Oh, Ishmael, where did you go? You've gone a few days' distance. Except that in Genesis 22, verse 1, we read, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a holocaust at the place that I will show you. No options there. 
And so what happens next? He takes Isaac to Mount Moriah. And they go to the top of the hill. But how does the story proceed? Who ends up carrying the wood to the top of the hill? Isaac. And what do all the ancient rabbis and the early church fathers imply from that? Quite legitimately, how old must Isaac have been if he was old enough and strong enough to carry the wood up to the top of a mountain? Four or five? Hardly. At least 17 was the rabbinic consensus. It's one thing for a 13-year-old slave boy to give consent, as he must have done, to be circumcised, to prove that he's a man. But supposing that Isaac was at least 17, going to the top of Moriah, that would imply that Abraham was around 120. Who could have stopped this at any time if he'd wanted to? Isaac. So why do the ancient rabbis and the early fathers Recognize that in this great test of faith, it isn't just one man's faith that's tested, but two. And the younger one was what? A willing victim who voluntarily gave consent to the obedience of the divine command. I want you to reflect upon that because it's the key that will end up unlocking the mystery of God's love as a father revealed when he did not withhold his only beloved son. That's right. The same phrase that you find in Genesis 22, verse 1, reappears in the New Testament. The Father's only beloved Son. Why? Because back in Genesis 22, what happened when they got to the top of the hill? He bound Isaac. The rabbinic tradition is Isaac knew that he might struggle, he might resist, and he might succeed. So he said, Father, bind me. That's why the whole episode is called in Hebrew, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And Abraham took the knife and was about to obey in the darkness of faith when the angel of the Lord called out and rewarded the faithfulness of the father and his only beloved son with an oath, a covenant that all the nations will be blessed through you, Abraham, and your seed. God would, in effect, take upon himself the responsibility for blessing all the nations. Back in the days of Genesis... In most of the other episodes, who is the agent that pronounces the blessings typically? A father, who are the recipients of the blessings throughout the patriarchal narratives in Genesis. The patriarch's sons. Only now, God says, I will be the agent of blessing, and the recipients of the blessing will be all the nations of the earth, implying that God is going to use Abraham as a kind of role model. Because now we see the true Father is God. And there will be an only beloved Son who is not spared, like Isaac was. There won't be a goat caught in a thicket, a ram that was sacrificed instead. 2,000 years later, one of the most prominent hills of Moriah is a place called Calvary. And what does God the Father allow? His only beloved Son to go to Moriah where the Lord would provide himself the lamb, as Abraham explained to Isaac. And of course, on that occasion, there was no ram caught in the thicket. There was no last-minute substitute. There was the completion of the covenant oath and the revelation of God's fatherly love in a son who was a willing victim like Isaac, but who gave his life so that we might enter the family of God the family of Abraham, and be blessed. Why do I go through all of this? Because Jesus does. Only He did it much more shortly. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John 8. In John 8, verse 31 to 44, Jesus is talking to the Jews who presume to have the blessing secured because they're descendants of Abraham. Jesus then said to the Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We're descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage. The truth will make us free. We are free. We're Abraham's offspring. We've never been in bondage, which is, of course, a historical error. Israel was in bondage at many points. Egypt, Babylon, so on. But Jesus goes on. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave doesn't continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. 
What's he assuming? He's asserting a little, but he's assuming a lot because they just claim to be Abraham's offspring. Yes, I understand you're Abraham's offspring, but the slave doesn't continue in the house forever. Only the son does. What is he implying? Ishmael is disinherited to make room for Isaac, the true son. The slave doesn't continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know you're descendants of Abraham, like Ishmael, yet you seek to kill me. And it goes on. Verse 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's techna, children, beloved children like Isaac, you would do what Abraham did, but now instead you seek to kill me. This whole exchange is based upon a spiritual lesson. That there's a profound difference between experiencing God like Ishmael experienced Abraham or experiencing God as Isaac experienced Abraham. There's a profound difference between slavery and sonship. And it's precisely to deliver us from spiritual slavery into the freedom and intimacy of knowing God as Abba Father. That's why God the Father sent the Son. And as we reflect upon Ishmael and Isaac, Hagar and Sarah, experiencing Abraham as a master, an owner, a Lord who can banish and disinherit us, or experiencing Abraham as Avram, a father who is faithful to my mother, his wife, for over a century. I want to help you to reflect upon not only the difference between Islam and Christianity in its deepest historical and spiritual roots, but also the difference between how we sometimes relate to God and experience our own faith as servants, as slaves, as employees, as property, who operate more out of fear than love, who think of ourselves more as slaves than sons. And in fact, John goes on to clarify this. Jesus does in John. John 15 We read in verse 12, This is my commandment that you love one another even as I have loved you. He had just finished telling them, not only do they get a new covenant, but a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, you can find the love commandment in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Leviticus 19, but never was the love commandment formulated in these terms. You love one another as I have loved you. Well, what kind of love is that? Stay tuned, disciples. You will see. He goes on, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Phyllis, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. It's the same Greek word as slaves. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I've heard from my Father I have made known to you. So up until now, the religion of the Old Testament was a preparation for the revelation of sonship, but the actual experience was slave. I mean, let's say that if God was only a master and we were only slaves, here we find a master who provides better for his slaves and most parents could ever hope for their own beloved children. But in the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, the Lord has become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's not just exalted, distant, and majestic. He is now stooping down to us, assuming our weakness, overcoming our disobedience, revealing the fact that love inspires more than law requires. That the son is called to outserve the mere servant. I want to propose that as we study comparative religions and as we contrast Islam and Christianity, there are many similarities to be sure, but there are also some dissimilarities. What are some of the similarities between Islam and Christianity? Number one, monotheism. And in the history of world religions, that's not a small similarity. 
since most have been polytheistic and idolatrous. Not only monotheistic, but the God of Abraham. Second of all, a belief in the supernatural, that there is good and evil. There is God and Satan. We share that in common also. Thirdly, this commitment to combat secularism, relativism, and the decay of culture and the natural, the moral law. And in fact, a recognition of the spiritual warfare that's involved in that sort of struggle. Fourth, this emphasis on the need to obey God, not only privately, but publicly, not only personally, but socially, and to see the rule of law rooted in the source of law, God, and not simply a majority. And finally, I think we also recognize this similarity in terms of prayer. I love the way Muslims are not only willing to pray in public, but in groups, with their bodies, kneeling, standing, prostrating. And men are doing it too! We have a lot in common, and I dare say we may have a lot to learn. But I have to say this, that while the similarities are great, the dissimilarities are greater. Because when we consider the dissimilarities, we see this profound break between God as Allah, who is master, lord, and owner, which makes us nothing more than property, slaves and servants. Abdullah literally means slave, and that's what all of us are, according to Islam. Whereas God, the Father, has sent His Son to give us the spirit of sonship, to confer upon us what we as creatures would never possess or attain on our own, and what is that divine sonship? Let me say it again. Until God the Father sent the Son, Father was a mere metaphor. It wasn't an actual name. Only when Jesus Christ comes as the Son of God to become the Son of Man can sons and daughters of men become sons and daughters of God. That's why... In John 14, verse 6, he says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to... No one comes to the Father. Notice he doesn't say, no one comes to God but by me. Because in fact, people have been coming to God long before Jesus came and apart from Christ. As the Catechism says, in describing it in paragraph 841, The church's relationship with the Muslims, the plan of salvation includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham. And then it goes on in 843 to acknowledge how the church recognizes in other religions that search among shadows and images for the God who is unknown yet near. And the church considers all goodness and truth found in these religions as a preparation for the gospel and given by him who enlightens all men that they may at length have life. Yet, it goes on to talk about the profound deception of the evil one into which most all of humanity has fallen and this idolatrous urge to serve the creature rather than the creator or to relate to God as slaves to a master. And then in that next section of the Catechism, a beautiful meditation on how the church is above all the family of God the Father, the kingdom of God the Son, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is revealed when God the Father sent the Son to illuminate our minds and hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, but not just with more factual information about God, but with an intimate relationship with God that even Abraham couldn't imagine. The Old Testament is fulfilled by Christ, but the fulfillment ends up being something that exceeds the highest hopes and the wildest dreams of the ancient Israelite faithful. It's one thing to see God as father-like. Even though he's a master, a shepherd, he cares for us better than parents care for their kids. But to actually unveil the face of God and to show us the face of Abba Father. I want to propose to you that we, as Catholic Christians, in the third millennium and the 21st century, are seeing a more rapid decay of what formerly was known as Christendom than at any point in history. You look at the Islamification of Europe, 
and you recognize demographics, that's destiny. They're just simply outpopulating us over there. And again, I'm not here just to kind of react or get alarmed. Although I would really encourage you to get informed, like I've been trying to do. And let me just stop for a minute here because I am a professor. I want to recommend one book by a good friend of mine, George Weigel. We gave an honorary doctorate not so long ago. It's entitled Faith, Reason, and the War Against Jihadism. He picks up right where Benedict left off in the Regensburg Address back in 2006, the first year of his pontificate. Another book. I'm not here to justify the Crusades, but I do want to challenge the common misconception that I got, along with practically everybody else, from men like Professor Runciman, who basically made the Crusades out to be this terrible Christian provocation of peace-loving Muslims. Granted, the Crusades have lots of evils perpetrated on both sides, but this book, really in a short order by a great scholar and writer, his name is Jonathan Riley Smith, The Crusades, Christianity, and Islam. He deconstructs the stereotypical narrative to show that what the Christians were doing was, among other things, going into the lands that were Christian, that had been conquered, to basically free the Christian men, women, and children who were being coerced into conversion to Islam. There was a spiritual root to this, along with many abuses, to be sure. But this is what you could call a war of defense. I also want to recommend, finally, a third book by a man who's been here in previous years, a friend of mine, Robert Spencer, who has the website Jihad Watch. This is one of several books. Anything by Robert Spencer, I think, is going to be strong and balanced. It is going to be well-researched, but he's not going to pull punches. This title is Islam Unveiled Disturbing Questions About the World's Fastest Growing Faith. We have got to see that Muslims serve the God of Abraham much like Ishmael served Abram as a master. Christians serve God as Isaac would have related to Abraham. But I want to propose that Isaac was not called upon to serve Abraham less than Ishmael. Isaac was not called upon to obey Abraham less than Ishmael. Isaac was not called upon to sacrifice with Abraham less than Ishmael. It's one thing to give consent to losing your foreskin. It's another thing to offer your body as a willing victim like Isaac did. Until the sons of God outserve the slaves of God, Christianity is going to continue to dissolve. You look at the One who is the Eternal Son, Jesus, the only begotten of the Father from all eternity. And that's why we can see that God is a Father more than He's a Creator because He is fathering from all eternity whereas creation begins in time. At the moment, time begins. And so when we consider this mystery, we recognize something that, oh, yes, it's very lofty, but it's also very practical because the eternal Son of the Father became a man to fulfill prophecy, foremost among which you have Isaiah's prophecies in the so-called servant songs. By the time you get to the fourth of those servant songs, we read all about the suffering servant, the anguish, the horror that he undergoes. Who is this? The suffering servant. And who is that? The eternal Son. It's one thing to serve God as a slave out of fear of being punished, to keep the commandments so you can be rewarded with a heaven that is merely human. It's another thing to obey God as a father, to respond to Him as a son, not out of fear but out of love. And we read about that sort of obedience in Philippians 2, where Christ Though he was equal with God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Though he's in the form of God, he takes the form of a servant. And what is he? Obedient, but not just to a law. Like an employee, he is obedient unto death, and not just any death, but the death on the cross. 
And this is why God the Father rewards the Son by giving Him a name above all names. What Paul is describing in Philippians 2 is not just the new understanding of Jesus He came to on the Damascus Road, but an entirely new understanding of God that He came to. As a Jew who believed that the Lord is our shepherd, but He's become the Lamb of God, He's offered up His life in order to show us what is truly and really supreme in God. As Pope Benedict puts it, when the shepherd, the living God himself became a lamb, he showed the world that it is not power, but love that redeems. It is love, not power, that is preeminent. This is the truth about God's supremacy. What is supreme in him is not his capacity to dominate creatures but his desire to pour himself out into us, to stoop down to us in our weakness, and then in the power of his omnipotent mercy to raise us up, not just to forgive slaves for transgressions, but to adopt us, to rebirth us, to endow us with the spirit of his own son so that we can cry out in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father, as we face our crosses, as we give consent to our sufferings. Because what the eternal Son shows the adopted sons is that God doesn't allow suffering in spite of His love. God allows us to undergo suffering precisely because of His love. Again, to quote Pope Benedict, pain is a part of being human. Anyone who wants to get rid of suffering would have to get rid of love before anything else. Because there can be no love without suffering. Because it always demands an element of self-sacrifice. Suffering is the process through which we mature and grow as God's children into the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the mystery of faith. This is the mystery of the cross. This is the mystery of the garden of Gethsemane. This is the mystery of the Eucharist. To quote another writer, When I regarded God as a tyrant, I considered my sin a trifle. But when I came to know Him as my true Father, then I was mourning that I could ever have sinned and rebelled against Him. When I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin. But when I discovered God's merciful kindness, so good, so overflowing with compassion... I would smite my breast to think I could have ever rebelled against one who loved me so and sought my good. This is the purpose of suffering, to call us out of ourselves, to enable us to love in a way that is truly godlike, to love as we have been loved. This is the new commandment. This is the new covenant. This is not human kinship, but divine kinship that God the Father sent the Son to give us the Spirit so that we can share divine life, that we could share divine, a love that is life-giving. What did Jesus do before He suffered? On the night that He was betrayed, He took bread. And when He had given thanks, what does He do? He institutes the Eucharist. You know why? Because He knew what would happen the next day. Calvary. And what is Calvary? We all know what Calvary is. It's a sacrifice. But as a matter of fact, nobody standing there on Good Friday would have gone home and described to their friends and neighbors that what they had witnessed was a sacrifice. It took place outside the city, far from the walls of Jerusalem, far from the temple. There were no priests. There were no altars. There was no sacrifice. The Jews would have described what they had witnessed as what? A Roman execution, plain and simple. So how does a Roman execution suddenly become not only a sacrifice, but the holiest sacrifice of all? By looking at Friday in the light of Thursday. By looking at Calvary in the light of the Eucharist he instituted the night before. As Pope Benedict puts it, in the Eucharistic words of Jesus, he undergoes a spiritual death. Or to put it more precisely, in these words, Jesus transformed suffering and death into an act of prayer, an affirmation of love, into the perfect act of self-giving love, into an act of perfect adoration. Both the Eucharist and Calvary, he said, are essential. 
interdependent. The words at the Last Supper without the death would be ritual and rhetoric. The death without these words would be a mere execution. The Eucharist as the new Passover is what transforms an execution into a sacrifice. And the hinge on which it all turns is the drama of Gethsemane. When the son who becomes the suffering servant obeys not just commandments, but is obedient unto death, even death on the cross, and he loves the will of God, not like a Muslim loves the will of Allah, but as a son loves the will of his father. To make his life a gift of love, proving that on Friday he wasn't the victim of Roman execution. He was already a victim of divine love the night before. And what does he call us to? Carry our crosses. And what does he call us to before that? Into our gardens of Gethsemane. But what does he give us to prepare us to cry out like he did in prayer, Abba, the Holy Eucharist. Just as the Eucharist transformed his suffering into a sacrifice, so it will also transform ours. And not only that, but it will lead us to enter into the glory of his resurrection. The similarities between Christianity and Islam are great. The dissimilarities are greater. We've got to learn to enter into religious dialogue with respect and mutual understanding. But we also have got to accept the responsibility of evangelizing them and everybody else, no matter what fears we might feel. And again I say, until those who are called to share divine sonship learn to obey and to serve more than mere slaves. A religion of divine slavery is going to continue to increase, whereas the religion of divine sonship will continue to decrease. Or as Proverbs puts it, listen to this text in Proverbs 17, verse 2. A slave who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully. A slave who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully. Divine slaves who deal wisely will rule over a whole continent of sons and daughters who have forfeited their birthright and have acted shamefully because they prefer material comfort on this earth which is so temporal and transitory to the eternal life within the eternal trinity who is perfect love. We are called to the Eucharist to receive and to adore. And then we are preparing for the gardens of Gethsemane and the crosses that we all are called upon to carry. But I want to propose to you that the suffering that God allows is not simply an expression of His wrath. Sure, God is angry. Not the same way I am. God's wrath is real, but it's a metaphor. It isn't the opposite of His love. As Pope Benedict explains, it's an expression of his love. I don't get mad at the neighbor's kids, but I do get mad at my own. Why? Because they're mine. Not because I stop loving them or start loving them less, but because I can't stop loving them. And God loves us infinitely more. His wrath is simply how his love feels when we experience it in sin. And so the suffering that he sends us is not simply punitive. It's primarily restorative. And it's the one thing that will constantly remind us of why we're here. That the reason for this world is to prepare us for a far greater one. That this was never meant to be our home. This was meant to be a testing ground. And it's become a battleground. But if we treat it like a playground, we lose. We forfeit our birthright, our inheritance. God the Father loves us more than we love ourselves. He loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And He proves it through the gift of His Son on the cross and through the gift of Christ and the Holy Eucharist whom we're about to adore. But I want to really encourage you to recognize that the tide of Islam that is growing represents a spiritual challenge of love to those who are called to be sons and daughters of Abba Father. We're not talking about different paths up the same mountain. We're talking about different mountains. We're talking about ascending into a heaven where we experience the 
Marriage supper of the Lamb. Not each man given 70 virgins. We're talking about martyrdom and not confusing it with mass murder. We're talking about relating to God as merciful and loving who knows us better than we'll ever know ourselves and who legislates what will fulfill and perfect us and get us home. And therefore, more than just giving consent to the loss of foreskin, we are willing to climb Moriah. We are willing to carry the cross. We are willing to be bound like Isaac, like the true Isaac, like the only beloved son of the divine father. And we're also willing to admit that we're not willing to do that. And we need his help. We need his forgiveness. We need his sacraments. We need his grace. We need his forbearance. And God wants to forgive us more than we want him to. And God is capable of healing our weaknesses and overcoming them more than we can imagine. We're called to serve someone who requires of us much more than mere slaves, but has given to us his only beloved son. The Trinity is the only God that exists. The Trinity is the only thing that God eternally is because he's eternal, creation's not. The Holy Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is the only thing that makes sense out of this world. The Holy Trinity is the only thing that God made us for. The Holy Trinity is not a theological burden or a mathematical abstraction. The Holy Trinity is our one true destiny and our one divine dignity. It is the reason for our the world. It is the reason for this conference. It is the reason for every moment of our lives from here until we behold the face of our Father together in all eternity. Dear brothers and sisters, God bless you.